the Greeks of Asia Minor, willing to claim back their freedom, revolted against Persian rule. The Ionian revolt was successful in the beginning, but ultimately failed to achieve its goal. This major historical event influenced the fate of mainland Greeks as well. What would thereafter happen, Greeks could only fearfully imagine. The series of events that followed proved to be of crucial importance, not only for the course of the entire Greek history, but as well for the identity and the culture of ancient Greeks. The extent of Athenian grief for fellow Greeks in Asia Minor is best shown in the following. A tragic poet named Phrynichus, not long after 494 BC, wrote a play called The Capture of Miletus, which mostly featured the cruel fate of the city and its inhabitants as the leitmotif. Persian authorities transferred grown men to live in an area around the Tigris River while women and children were enslaved. The audience was moved to tears and the poet fined for reminding familiar misfortunes. After the failure of the Ionian revolt in 494 BC, the Rais decided to wage war upon Greeks in Europe. As an empire in expansion, Persia was naturally inclined to conquer new lands, but there were specific reasons for invading mainland Greece. Two Greek city-states provided the Greeks in Ionia with military aid, Athens and Eretria. During the siege of Sardis, a fire broke out and the whole city was consumed in flames. Both Athenians and Eretrians participated in this event. According to Herodotus, Darius, upon hearing the news of Greeks burning Sardis to the ground, asked who these Athenians were. He demanded his servant to remind him every day about seeking retaliation for the misdeeds of the Athenians. The Greco-Persian Wars is a term coined by historians to designate a period in history in which Greeks and the Persian Empire were engaging in a series of military conflicts. This period lasted between the years of 499 BC and 479 BC. In this video, we will turn our attention to the period after the Ionian Revolt, which will be the topic of another video in the future. Our main source for this decisive part of Greek history is the historian Herodotus. As a matter of fact, his whole narrative is based around the Greco-Persian conflict. At the very beginning of histories, Herodotus tells us that this war inspired him to start writing history and that his aim is to prevent the memory of great deeds from falling into oblivion. Darius launched his first campaign in 492 BC. The Persians were led by Mardonius, the king's trusted general. He had two main objectives. First, to solidify Persian rule in Thrace and Macedon established during Darius's Syrian campaign in the years of 513 and 512 BC, and second, attack Greece from the north. The ground forces were moving along the northern coast of the Aegean Sea, followed by the Persian fleet. Yet, the invasion was unsuccessful due to a storm which wiped out a large part of the fleet near Athos. Determined to punish the Greeks nonetheless, Darius started planning another campaign. This time, his forces were to take another route across the Aegean Sea. In the year 490 BC, the mighty Persian fleet, led by Datis and Artaphernes, set sail and captured the island of Naxos. Not long after, the majority of the Cyclades fell under Achaemenid rule. 
the Persians disembarked on Euboea and burned the city of Eretria to the ground as an act of revenge for their involvement in the Aeonian revolt. At this time, the Athenians are readily expecting the Persians to land on Attica and attack their polis. The Marathon Plain was chosen for landing since its terrain enabled the Persians to use their cavalry. Upon their landing at Marathon, the Persians were in no hurry to initiate the battle. The Athenians were led by Kalimachos, the Archon Polymarch, and had around 9,000 men at the disposal. The high command was hesitant whether they should attack as soon as possible or wait for the Persians to attack first. Although vastly outnumbered, a vigorous strategos, Miltiades, proposed to Kalimachos Athenians launch an attack promptly. As Herodotus claims, Athens was in danger of surrendering to Persians due to existence of a pro-Persian party in the city which finally instigated the Athenians to attack first. The right flank was commanded by Kalimachos himself, while the far left flank was manned by Plataeans from Boeotia. The Greek middle was probably intentionally left thinner in order to generate more force on flanks which, according to the plan, were to encircle Persian forces. The Persians weren't adequately prepared for the Athenian offensive. Deeming the Greeks mad, the invaders were completely surprised by the sudden attack. Knowing the enemy archers were a great threat, the Athenians covered as much distance as fast as possible. Although heavily armored in accordance with the standard hoplite panoply, these tactics proved most crucial in achieving victory. The Athenians managed to close the gap and engage in melee combat with their foes. Once in close quarters combat, the Persians proved themselves no match for superior Greek hoplites. Even though the Persians succeeded in suppressing the Greek center, both flanks were shattered, followed by encirclement of the remainder Persian troops. The aftermath of the Battle of Marathon was heavy Persian losses. 6,400 men, while only 192 Greeks died, amongst them the polemarch Kalimachos. The Persians attempted to conduct a daring move and capture Athens while the main body of soldiers was still at Marathon, but failed to do so because the victors from Marathon had already returned. The significance of the Greek victory at Marathon was immense. First, the Greeks proved themselves a worthy opponent to the Persians, who were at that time considered fierce warriors, and their very appearance brought intimidation upon their enemies. Second, the myth of Marathon was to remain ingrained in Greek memory and tradition as one of the brightest moments of Greek history. Third, Athens gained a considerable amount of respect among other Greeks. Miltiades was praised for contributing to this victory by providing wise counsel and fighting courageously. The Athenians started building a new temple on the Acropolis in honor of their victory at Marathon. This temple was located on the exact same spot where the Parthenon was going to be built and was never finished due to Persian destruction of Athens in 480 BC. Also, the old Propylon was built, which will be replaced in the times of Pericles by the new Propyleia of architect Mnesicles. On the northern side of the Athenian Agora, a new building was erected, the painted porch or the Stoa Poikile. Inside, a painting was to be found depicting the Battle of Marathon. A discipline in the Olympic Games was named after the location of this famous battle. Upon winning the battle, it was said that Philippides had been sent to deliver the news of victory to Athens, and having done so, he ran a distance of approximately 42 kilometers, an act which was ever after praised by running in a marathon race. Receiving the news of the disaster at Marathon, Darius was furious and wanted to start another campaign with many more ground and naval forces than the previous one. 
Darius's plan never materialized since a rebellion broke out in Egypt and required his attention. Shortly after, he died in 486 BC. The Achaemenid throne was succeeded by his son, Xerxes I, who would continue his father's work and invade mainland Greece once more. In this video, we have covered the history of Greco-Persian wars from 494 BC to the Battle of Marathon. The next video will deal with Xerxes' invasion of Greece, including the Battle of Thermopylae. Feel free to leave suggestions for future videos. This channel deals not only with ancient Greek history, but with all aspects of the ancient Greek civilization. Sources, society, religion, mythology, philosophy, art, famous individuals, and so on. Links to social media pages are in the description. Thank you for watching this documentary about the Greco-Persian Wars on the Ancient Greek Logos channel. O Xein, Angelin Lacedaimoniois, Hotite de Keimetha, Tois Keinon, Remasipate Homenoi. Having crushed the Ionian Revolt, Darius intended to penalize the Athenians and the Eretrians for helping the Greeks in Asia Minor. A great Persian fleet had set sail in 490 BC and was able to subjugate the Cyclades. After that, the city of Eretria was sacked and burned to the ground. The deciding battle between the Persians and the Athenians was fought on the Marathon Plain in Attica. Thanks to Miltiades' counsel, the Athenians succeeded in utterly crushing the invading Persian forces and annulling Darius' intention of conquering Greece. In 486 BC, Xerxes succeeded the Achaemenid throne. Formidable times and despair were yet to come and put the Greeks' capabilities to a final test. Upon pacifying the Egyptian revolt in 483 BC, Xerxes began comprehensive preparations for the invasion of Greece. A canal was dug through Athos, long 2.41 kilometers, and a bridge across the river Strimon constructed. The path which was to be taken was the one Mardonius took in 492 BC. In 481 BC, Xerxes arrived at Sardis, while the army gathered in Cappadocia. The crossing of the Hellespont took place in April 480 BC. The Persian fleet was moving parallel with ground troops. Herodotus tells us that this was the largest force Greeks ever had a chance to fight against. The sheer number of soldiers fighting under Persian command was so great that allegedly it took them seven days and nights to cross the Hellespont. The Greek historian estimates the total number of Xerxes' troops at around 1,700,000, adding that 46 different peoples participated in this enterprise. As is the case with the majority of ancient authors, these numbers must have been exaggerated and are to be taken with a grain of salt. But the crossing wasn't smooth. The first bridge that had been built was destroyed by a storm that supposedly caused Xerxes to impulsively order his subjects to whip the disobedient sea. After the second construction of the bridge, the Persians were able to cross the sea between Abydos and Sestos. By August of 480 BC, the Persians would have reached the peninsula of Halkiriki and were preparing to march southwards. Let us discuss what was happening in Greece before the arrival of Persian troops. 
after Darius's failed campaign from 490 BC, the Greeks must have been aware that another invasion is going to take place sooner or later. Athens especially took adequate steps to strengthen its army. Even before Darius's invasion, in the year 493 BC, Themistocles was elected the eponymous Archon and induced Athenians to fortify Piraeus. Also, in 483 BC, thanks to Themistocles' proposal, the state decided to build 200 new ships, funded by the income of the silver mines in Attica, instead of sharing it among citizens. In 481 BC, a Panhellenic assembly was held on the Isthmus, where the participating Greek polis were to decide means by which they are going to hold off the forthcoming Persian invasion. Ever so divided, only 31 Greek state partook in the assembly gathering. These polis concluded an alliance against Persia under a sworn oath. It was decided that Sparta wield supreme command over land and naval forces respectively. The northern Greeks, including Thessaly and Boeotia, didn't participate because they would be the first to confront the Persians without any real hope of receiving major help from southern Greeks. Assistance was requested from Crete, Corcyra and Syracuse, but the appeal remained futile. The Greeks gathered at the assembly once more in spring of 480 BC to discuss their strategy. Unlike the previous assembly, Thessalians were now present and demanded the passage lying on the slopes of Mount Olympus, called Tempe, be the point of Greek defense. A force of 10,000 hoplites was dispatched, but soon after arriving, the Greeks were unpleasantly surprised by the discovery of two more passages, rendering their position useless. Instead, the Greek allies chose to defend the passage at the hot gates, Thermopylae. This decision caused all Greek states between Tempe and Thermopylae to join Xerxes' forces by symbolically delivering earth and water. Thermopylae was a wise location to offer resistance to Persian invaders due to the convenient layout of the terrain. The Greeks were aware of superior Persian numbers and tried to mitigate it by forcing it into combat on narrow space where the hoplite style of fighting could exert maximum efficiency. Although it is always said that 300 Spartans only were fighting at Thermopylae, the truth is that around 7,000 Greeks total were present. The small number of soldiers Spartans sent is to be remarked. The Lacedaemonians were expecting the main battle to be fought at the Isthmus, ready to faint-heartedly let the Greeks north of the Isthmus fall under Persian rule. This stance was evident even during the Battle of Marathon, when Spartan authorities refused to send troops to aid Athens, and will also be noticed in the wake of the Battle of Salamis. Shortly after setting the perimeter at Thermopylae, the Greeks had discovered that a secret path through the mountain to the west of the main passage existed. Those were inauspicious news, but nonetheless it was decided to stay at Thermopylae. The supreme commander of Greek forces was Leonidas, the Spartan king. He dispatched a contingent of Phocaeans to guard the secret passage, while the main body of Greek forces remained at the main passage of Thermopylae. Persian forces camp was established near the town of Trachis. Expecting the Greeks to either surrender or retreat, Xerxes was idle for four days. On the fifth day, the Persian king lost patience and ordered an attack. Being heavily defeated, the Persians suffered great losses at the end of that day. Even the immortals, who were renowned as the best fighters Persia could offer, 
had no success. The following day brought Xerxes nothing more than disappointment, and Herodotus writes that it seemed obvious to the Persian king that he had many men but few heroes. But the good fortune Greeks have so far enjoyed was about to change. A local named Ephialtes sought audience with Xerxes. He then revealed that a hidden path existed and could be exploited for flanking the Greeks. On the seventh day, Xerxes and his immortals under Hedarnes' command during the night. Upon meeting the Persians, the Phocaeans guarding the passage routed. Soon after, the Greeks in Thermopylae found out that the hidden passage had been discovered. Most of the Greeks fell back, obeying Leonidas' order, while he stayed at Thermopylae with Thespians, Thebans and his Spartans, deeming retreating disgraceful. Although being aware that death is certain, the remaining Greeks provided fierce resistance, which took many Persian lives, including two Xerxes' brothers' lives. Shortly after, Leonidas was killed in combat and Spartans continued fighting by his corpse bitterly. Their fate was sealed after Hidarnes and Ephialtes appeared from the hidden mountain path. It was said that many Spartans fought valiantly at the Battle of Thermopylae, especially the witty Dionysus. Hearing that Persian archers are so numerous and upon firing they can cover the sun Dionysus said that this is good, since they would fight the Persians in shade. The famous epitaph concerning fallen Spartan warriors at Thermopylae, which Herodotus quotes, testifies the stoic nature of Spartan customs. The story of Thermopylae and the brave Spartans became one of the most heroic and yet tragic events in Greek history. The practical side of this battle was that Greeks, although through a sacrifice, gained more time to prepare for a final clash with the Persians. After the Battle of Thermopylae, Xerxes conquered Boeotia and had the path to Athens wide open. In this video, we have covered the history of Greco-Persian wars from 490 BC to the Battle of Thermopylae. The topic of the next video will be the fateful battle of Salamis. Feel free to leave suggestions for future videos. This channel deals not only with ancient Greek history, but with all aspects of the ancient Greek civilization. Sources, society, religion, mythology, philosophy, art, famous individuals, and so on. Links to social media pages are in the description. Thank you for watching this documentary about the Greco-Persian Wars on the Ancient Greek Logos channel. O Xeine, eu hidron pokenaiomes asti korintho, nindame, aiantos nasos, ehei salamis. In the previous video, we have covered the events from 490 BC up to 480 BC, ending with the Battle of Thermopylae. Darius the Great launched two campaigns against the Greeks, and both were unsuccessful. Succeeding his father in 486 BC, Xerxes commenced an invasion on a great scale in 480 BC. By August of the same year, all Greek lands north of the passage of Thermopylae subdued to the Persians. The rest of the Greeks were disunited and questioned whether they should provide greater resistance at Thermopylae. As a result, a small force led by the Spartan king Leonidas sallied out and confronted the enemy. The Greeks were vastly outnumbered, but offered vehement combat. Upon discovering a hidden path, the Persians were finally able to defeat the heroic Greek contingent. The subsequent events proved to be crucial for the conclusion of the Greco-Persian conflict.
Before exploring the Persian advancement towards Athens, let us briefly look into the events happening on the seas in August 480 BC, simultaneously with the Battle of Thermopylae. Both Persian and Greek land forces were accompanied by naval support at all times. Since two armies met at Thermopylae, the fleets were to encounter each other at the bay between mainland Greece and the Euboea. Aware of being numerically inferior, the Greeks were cautious with engaging the Persian fleet. The two opposing sides were trying to outmaneuver each other, and it seems that the Persian fleet suffered some losses, mostly because of storms. The sources provide us not only with insufficient information, but appear confusing in some aspects, thus leaving us unable to fully reconstruct the events before and after this battle. However, Herodotus tells us the majority of Allied fleet was sent to guard Artemisium, while 53 Athenian ships were left behind at Euripus, a sea passage between the island of Euboea and Attica. The 53 ships in reserve were probably to engage a potential Persian detachment trying to bypass the island Euboea. Truly, the Persians tried such maneuver but sustained great losses due to a storm at the southern shore of Euboea. Finally, the Persians initiated an attack at Artemisium, and the battle was undecided with both sides suffering casualties. Upon hearing grievous news of the defeat at Thermopylae, the Greek fleet was compelled to abandon its position at Artemisium. Xerxes' troops now free to seize all lands north of the Isthmus, marched through Boeotia unopposed. Even the gods seem to have abandoned the Greeks. The Oracle of Delphi, noticeably with a pro-Persian attitude during the entire war, advised the Athenians to flee for their lives. The Athenians found themselves in a situation most dire. It was discovered that the Peloponnesian Greeks had started building a wall on the Isthmus, a spot intended for offering final resistance to the invaders, even though the previous agreement anticipated resistance be provided in Boeotia. All Greeks north of the Isthmus were left to fend for themselves, including Athens. A swift decision had been made, and it was arranged for women and children of Athens to be evacuated to nearby Troizen. Aegina and Salamis. Nevertheless, a small unit was left behind on the Acropolis. An oracle from Delphi supposedly foretold the complete destruction of Attica, except one wooden wall. The Acropolis defenders believed the oracle had been referring to their barricades instead of the allied ships. Around mid-September in 480 BC, Xerxes arrived at Athens and was able to seize the Acropolis after two weeks of besieging. The Persians pillaged the temples and then burned them to ashes as an act of vengeance for the Athenian involvement during the Ionian Revolt. In late September 480 BC, on the island of Salamis, a war council was held. It was being debated whether the fleet should confront the Persians at the Isthmus or Salamis. The first option objectively was perhaps a better choice, because the land forces would have been near the fleet and also, in case of a defeat, the Greek navy could easily retreat from the Isthmus. However, the fighting would have gone on Persian terms, since it would have been done on open sea. The Peloponnesian police were advocating this option, while naturally, the Greeks north of the Isthmus were urging to take a stand at Salamis, including Athens, Megara and Aegina. Fighting at Salamis in practice meant that the Greeks were forced to fight to death without any possibility of retreating, but could make use of the terrain and effectively negate the numerical advantage of the Persians. Yet the Spartans, assuming supreme command over land and naval forces respectively, wouldn't give in and wanted to fight near the Isthmus. At this very moment, 
Themistocles warned the Spartans that if the battle wouldn't take place at Salamis, then the Athenians would abandon the war and sail off to South Italy in search of a new homeland. Realizing they would have no possible chance fighting the Persians without the Athenian fleet, which constituted half of the entire Allied fleet, the Spartan commander Eurybiades decided the Allied fleet would fight in the bay between Attica and Salamis. Meanwhile, Xerxes was overly confident in his numerical superiority. Artemisia, the ruler of Halicarnassus and the Persian king's subject, made an argument that it would be best if they waited on the Greeks to run out of food and supplies instead of commencing a battle at Salamis. However, the Achaemenid king wouldn't listen. The Greek fleet was anchored near the city of Salamis, while the Persian vessels stayed south of the small island of Cytalia. Being aware of the Allies' shifty behavior, and rightfully so, Themistocles wanted the battle to begin as soon as possible. However, he also knew the Greeks' only chance was to fight in the narrow sea north from Cytalia. To prompt the Persians into attacking, he devised a cunning trick. A message carried by a slave was sent to Xerxes, which aimed to deceive him by appearing that Themistocles had betrayed the Greeks. The letter said that the Greeks are disunited and are ready to depart from their positions any moment which provides the Persians with a great opportunity to attack the enemy in disarray. Luckily, Themistocles' trick worked and Xerxes took the bait. The Achaemenid king oversaw the battle from the land on Attica. The Greek fleet numbered around 370 ships as opposed to about 1,000 Persian vessels. The left allied flank was manned by the Athenians and was facing towards the Phoenicians. The right was occupied by the Spartans, opposing to the Ionians under Persian command. As Themistocles expected, the battle was fought under best terms possible for the Greeks. The sheer numbers worked against the Persians. Having been initially lined up in three ranks, the Persian fleet sailed into the strait. Disorganized and unable to maneuver, the Persians' morale quickly started deteriorating under courageous Greeks' attack. Herodotus says Artemisia was valiantly fighting during the battle, unlike other Persian troops. Allegedly, it was believed that Xerxes, referring to Artemisia, said the following words My men have become women and my women men. The aftermath was the following Xerxes' fleet suffered a crushing defeat with about 200 ships being destroyed while the Greeks lost around 40 vessels. Extant Greek sources including Herodotus and Aeschylus who himself took part in the battle depicts Xerxes after the defeat in his tragedy called the Persians being frightened and fleeing back to Asia Minor in terror. Although the Persian king indeed retreated to the east, it was because the Greeks in Asia Minor could have tried to rebel against the Persian rule upon hearing of the victory at Salamis. And truly, an uprising of the Greeks in Ionia broke out the following year. Albeit the Greek allies achieved an important victory at Salamis, the Persian threat was still looming. Xerxes' trusted general Mardonius was left behind in mainland Greece with the goal to finish the conquest. Still many in numbers, the Persians decided to winter over in Thessaly and continue the campaign in spring of 479 BC. During the Persian ground forces' retreat, the Greeks, led under the Spartan Cleombrotus, Leonidas's brother, attempted to intercept them. On October the 2nd, just before attacking, Cleombrotus was performing a sacrifice and during that a solar eclipse took place. The occurrence had been interpreted as bad omen 
and the plan was abandoned, leaving the Persian retreat to Thessaly unobstructed. This episode has covered the events after the Battle of Thermopylae, concluded with the naval clash at Salamis. In the following video, we will turn our attention to the unraveling of the Greco-Persian conflict and the battles of Plataea and Mycale. Feel free to leave suggestions for future videos. This channel deals not only with ancient Greek history, but with all aspects of the ancient Greek civilization. Sources, society, religion, mythology, philosophy, art, famous individuals, and so on. Links to social media pages are in the description. Thank you for watching this documentary about the Greco-Persian Wars on the Ancient Greek Logos channel. Andron ton arete, afthiton aiei, eschon gar pezoite kai okiporon epineon, helada me pasan dulion emar iden. The last episode has covered the occurrences concerning the battles of Artemisium and Salamis. Finding themselves in a situation most dire, the Athenians were forced to heavy-heartedly abandon their homes. The polis of Salamis, Aegina and Troizen provided refuge for Athenian women and children. Once again, a wise yet daring strategos saved the day, not only for the Athenians, but for all other mainland Greeks. Cunning Themistocles managed to lure the Persians into attacking the allied Greek fleet in the Straits of Salamis, negating the superior numbers of Xerxes' navy. Although the Greeks inflicted a crushing blow upon the Persian fleet, the threat of Achaemenid enslavement was still looming. The majority of Persian ground forces were left to overwinter in Thessaly, under Mardonius' command. During the period of idleness, Mardonius tried to create a strife among the Athenians and Lacedaemonians. Being a subject of Xerxes, the Macedonian king Alexander I was sent as an envoy to the Athenians with terms. The Persians offered war reparations and alliance, leaving Athens an independent polis. The Spartans knew, should the Athenians accept this offer, they themselves would be doomed. An embassy was promptly dispatched to the Athenians in order to promise them material assistance for war casualties. Nonetheless, the Athenians declined Mardonius's offer and, in following words, added, Now carry this answer back to Mardonius from the Athenians, that as long as the sun holds the course by which he goes now, we will make no agreement with Xerxes. We will fight against him without ceasing, trusting in the aid of the gods and the heroes whom he has disregarded and burned their houses and their adornments. Paradoxically, Mardonius's attempt to divide the Athenians and the Spartans must have achieved quite the opposite. Now the Spartans realized they would have to become more flexible or the Athenians might turn to Persia. Soon after the failed diplomatic mission, the wall on the Isthmus was at last finished. Feeling safe at the moment, the Peloponnesians started acting selfishly yet again. As an excuse, they stated the celebration of the festival named Hyakintia prevented them from aiding Athens, just as the celebration of Carnea allegedly hindered them in sending more troops to Thermopylae a year ago. In spring of 479 BC, Mardonius marched through Boeotia and was able to seize Athens for the second time, compelling the Athenians to evacuate once more. Thereafter, Mardonius offered the same terms to the Athenians he had presented them before. Meanwhile, Athens, Megara and Plataea immediately gave the Lacedaemonians an ultimatum. Should they deny military aid, 
a treaty would be made with Mardonius. Ten days later, the ephors finally decided to send a substantial force led by Pausanias, the regent of his underage nephew and Leonidas' son, Pleisterhos. Mardonius responded by retreating to Thebes in Boeotia, where a camp was established. The Greek and Persian ground armies finally met in Boeotia in August 479 BC. Mardonius was cautious and took a defensive stance. Greek forces numbered around 80,000 men and Persian forces about 110,000. The Spartans and the Tegeans made up the right flank, while the Athenians were positioned on the left flank led by Aristides. The supreme commander of Greek forces, Pausanias, had expected the Persians to attack first, but nothing more than skirmishes was made. Ten days later, Pausanias ordered the relocation of all troops in order to obtain a better strategic position. At this time, Mardonius caught sight of the maneuver and ordered a hasteful attack. The Persians had one great advantage. The Greeks had no cavalry to oppose the elite eastern cavalrymen. A cavalry contingent had managed to intercept the moving Spartans and the battle began. Not long after, the majority of the Persian forces arrived, with Mardonius himself leading the charge. However, the battle was fought on Greeks' terms again. The induced Persian attack happened on an uneven terrain, where the efficiency of cavalry was significantly reduced. The fighting was nonetheless fierce. Spartan hoplites were slowly pushing the Persian forces back, and at one point Mardonius fell in battle. Although he fought courageously, his death marked the turning point. Persian morale fell apart and the soldiers started routing not long after. Spartan discipline and the capability of its hoplites came to full expression at the Battle of Plataea. The curiosity of this battle lies in the fact that it was decided by a fraction of troops from both sides. On the Greek side, the Spartans and the Tegeans did most of the fighting, while a large part of the Persian army led by Artabazus didn't even participate, maybe because of the rivalry between him and Mardonius. In honor of this battle, the victors dedicated a votive gift to Apollo in Delphi. The golden tripod, also known as the Plataean tripod, sat on a pillar bordered by three bronze snakes, the serpent column. It carried an inscription consisting of the names of Greek polis participating in this war. What is left of it today is only the pillar without the tripod and the snakes. It can be found in modern-day Istanbul, since Constantine the Great had arranged a relocation to his newly founded city of Constantinople in 330 AD. The Greek victory at Plataea signified the end of Persians' offensive and the beginning of Greek attacks. First, the city of Thebes had been captured and the political leaders were punished for their previous cooperation with the Persians. The Allied fleet was mostly idle after the Battle of Salamis, and it was so because the Greeks didn't know the number of ships the Persians had on disposal. Before the Battle of Plataea, the Allied fleet was stationed on the island of Delos. Extant sources, including Herodotus, claim the battles of Plataea and Mycale were fought on the same day. This is probably false. Firstly, it is hard to believe the fleet set out to Asia Minor before the victory at Plataea. The Greeks must have felt secure to move out only after defeating Mardonius' army. Secondly, in Greek historiography it is not rare to find assertions about major battles being fought on the same day. During the Persian invasion of 480 BC, another fateful war was fought, this time on the island of Sicily. According to Herodotus, the deciding battle of Himera between the Greeks and the Carthaginians took place on the exact same day as the Battle of Salamis. On the other hand, Diodorus of Sicily claims the Battle of Himera was fought on the same day as the Battle of Thermopylae, 
whatever the case, these battles proved crucial in deciding the fate of the Greeks. Although low in probability, Greek tradition felt convenient to emphasize the importance of these events by presenting them as happening at the same day because of the profound importance they carried for all Greeks living in the 5th century BC. By all odds, the Battle of Mycale took place a few days after the clash of two armies at Plataea in late August 479 BC. The Greeks from Asia Minor requested Leotichides, who was the Spartan king and supreme commander of Allied fleet, sail to Asia Minor and liberate fellow Greeks from Persian rule. Leotichides accepted and soon enough disembarked on the coast near Mount Mycale. The majority of the Persian army consisted of Ionian Greeks, which deserted to Leotichides during the battle, enabling the Greeks an easy victory. Delivered from the Persian yoke, the Greeks in Asia Minor joined the Greek alliance. At this time, Leotichides and his Spartans decided to sail back home. Afterwards, in a series of military successes, the Athenians set their course towards building their 5th century maritime empire, but that will be the topic of another video. Ships commanded under Athens set sail for Hellespont with purpose of eliminating the remnants of Persian rule in Europe. Achaemenid resistance was concentrated in the city of Sestos. The siege of Sestos is the very last event Herodotus describes in his histories. The city fell in Greek hands in 478 BC. Pindar, the famous poet living during the time of Greco-Persian wars, wrote From Salamis I will win as my reward the gratitude of the Athenians and in Sparta from the battles before Cithaeron, those battles in which the Medes with their curved bows suffered sorely. With crucial victories at Salamis in 480 BC, Plataea and Mycale in 479 BC, the Greeks were finally able to repel the Persians back to Asia. Had they succumbed to the eastern menace, it would be questionable whether the Greek civilization would have flourished and whether their values embodied in art, philosophy and democracy would have had such a major influence on modern civilization. The cost was paid in many brave lives, including the one of a Spartan king, and complete victory achieved thanks to wise commanders like Miltiades and Themistocles. The people of Athens commemorated these events via modifying their coinage. From now on, the goddess Athena wore a laurel wreath. The consequence of the Greco-Persian conflict was the liberation of the Greeks in Asia Minor from Achaemenid rule. But much more important was that Athens, although suffering heavy losses, ultimately gained the most out of this war. The scene had been set and the Delian League was found in 478 BC and through time the Athenians succeeded in establishing hegemony in the Aegean Basin. With this video we have covered the entirety of the Greco-Persian Wars save the Ionian Revolt which will be the topic of another video in the future. Feel free to leave suggestions for future videos. This channel deals not only with ancient Greek history, but also with all aspects of the ancient Greek civilization. Sources, society, religion, mythology, philosophy, art, famous individuals, and so on. Thank you for watching this documentary about the Greco-Persian Wars on the Ancient Greek Logos channel.